Hey there, I'm Jay Danley, and today I'm going to talk to you about one of my all-time favorite composers. When I say the words cartoon music, I'm wondering if you can think of the name of the composer who invented, essentially invented, cartoon music. One of the greatest contributors in, uh, to, to uh, 20th century North American culture, in my opinion, not to overstate it. Uh, his name is Carl Stalling. And uh, you really ought to check out his music. This is incredibly wild stuff. This is the person that eventually invented all of what we now consider to be the cliches of cartoon music. We've certainly, you know, cartoon scoring has moved on uh, since Stalling's inventions. But there is no more significant contributor to the art of scoring for cartoons and animated films than Carl Stalling. This is the pioneer. This is the guy that kind of got the whole ball of wax rolling uh, or the boulder rolling down the hill or whatever analogy you'd like to use. Think of your own cartoon analogy for that. So here we go. This is uh, the, my first installment on talking about Carl Stalling and his approach to scoring for animated films, animated shorts back in the days. We called them cartoons now. Here it is. Carl Stalling began his career accompanying silent films either at the piano or organ, and other times with an orchestra. While working at a theater in Kansas City, he became the orchestra leader, choosing the music for feature films and composing his own material for what were called the shorts, meaning short films. Right from the very beginning then, and I'll repeat this, he was actually composing his own music often while, uh, while just there at the piano or the organ for the films that were being played because uh, he didn't have the, the instruction sheets that they did have were often not very, very detailed if they had anything at all. So he would be just asked to uh, call, call upon things that were appropriate. And he would be making a lot of it up on the spot. He would also use a lot of quotes. Uh, so again, from the very beginning of his career, there would be a combination of original and popular music, which would be a hallmark of his cartoon scores, of his cartoon scores. Silent movie scores in quotes, were a mixture of classical music, semi-classical music, and popular songs. Each would be chosen because the piece fitted the mood and supported the action on the screen. A lot of what I'm going to be reading here is stuff that I found in other books, and I'm going to give the citations as we go. That was from Frederick Hodges' The Art of Accompanying Silent Films uh, on the website www.frederickhodges.com. Silent movie scores, sometimes called thematic music cue sheets, and I'm going to put an image up of one here right now, would typically have, along with the music, cues to indicate where to begin playing a certain part of the score by describing the on-screen action. The name of the quoted piece would be placed above the music and the expected duration would be indicated. Often there would be an instruction telling how to play the selection and how to emphasize the action on the screen. These practices would help to set the template for how Stalling would go about uh, doing his scores, doing his original work. During this time of accompanying silent films, Stalling would at times be forced to create music on the spot, usually to fill time, for example, when the reels were being changed or as mentioned above for the shorts, which called for him to either pull out songs from memory or in some cases to improvise music. When asked by Bill Spicer in an interview in 1969 if he'd done any composing before his cartoon work, he replied, No, I improvised at the theaters, and that's composing, but it's not writing it down. I think that improvising is composing. Maybe you do too. Um, but there you go. He, he was insisting at that point, I suppose, that uh, if it's not written down on paper, then it's not really composing. Okay, it's an opinion. One of the earliest scores Stalling did was for the cartoon The Skeleton Dance, released in 1929 by Walt Disney. In this case, the music was all original Stalling compositions. Disney was reluctant to pay for copywritten music as asking Stalling to write something like an already existing piece of music, says Stalling. When we were working out a story, usually for the silly symphonies, I would sometimes use a musical number as a pattern, suggesting a certain style or mood. I would play it on the piano for the director and then write something similar, but original for the recording. Basically rewriting other people's material and claiming it as original so that royalties would not have to be paid. As always. An example of this is found in the scene where a skeleton creeps horizontally across the screen. 
The musical theme is one that suggests a piece of music called Mysterioso Pizzicato, the villain's theme, that was first published in the book The Remick Folio of Moving Pictures Music, Volume 1, published by Jerome H. Remick and Company in 1914. In the example I'm putting up on the screen right now, Violin is the melody of Mysterioso Pizzicato, and Violin 2 is Stalling's original work that implies this theme. Mysterioso Pizzicato goes, bum, 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 bum. Stallings' original work goes, bum, 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 Slightly different, claiming it to be original, but very much similar to Mysterioso Pizzicato, of course. And all Stalling would do 20 cartoons for Disney. At the Disney studio, Stalling would begin scoring a cartoon while in meetings with the director and animators. A system of mathematics was developed which included knowing how many frames of film would go by per second. Each gag would be timed to the second so that the animators would know how many cells or drawings were needed and Stalling could figure out how many seconds of a theme would work. The director would describe the action and the mood desired in the score. The film would be divided into sections that were basically gags. Each gag was timed by the director and Stalling would time the music by deciding how much of each theme would be used and at what tempo. It was also in these meetings that Stalling began to develop his ideas about how to musically emphasize the action on the screen. When the director would describe a character tiptoeing in a scene, Stalling would suggest pizzicato strings by placing his hand against the strings of the piano and playing a series of muted notes. Or when a character fell from a great height, Stalling would suggest a long glissando from the high register of the piano to the low end, ending in a great crash. Says cartoon composer Bill Boughton, One of the amazing things about Stalling was that he basically invented all of the cliches. That's from the, uh, the video Looney Tunes Behind the Tunes, Merry Melodies, Carl Stalling and Cartoon Music. Uh, and you can find that video, of course, on YouTube. This is where Stallings' greatest contributions to animated film scoring takes place. Beforehand, the music of Warner Brothers cartoons, scored by Frank Marsalis, in quotes, was like something you'd find in the street. It was absolutely lacking in anything you needed to make a picture good. He didn't synchronize. Before Carl, the music was used only to set the tempo, which was usually impossibly slow, unless we picked it up for something he'd understand, like a chase. That can be found, that quote can be found in the really amazing book written by Daniel Goldmark. Kind of uh, the, the, the essential book on cartoon scoring, and the particularly early, the history of and the early cartoon scoring is called Tunes for Tunes, T-U-N-E-S for T-O-O-N-S. Music and the Hollywood Cartoon. Uh, Berkeley Press, University of uh, Berkeley, University of California Press from 2005. The director Fritz Freeling recalled, I did everything in phrases of fours and twos so Carl could follow it. If a character walked, I'd put down the steps evenly and he would write the music to those steps. I'd never leave him in the middle of a beat or the middle of a phrase. That's from Daniel Goldmark, Goldmark's book too. Popular music, while often thought of as prohibitively expensive, at least until a 1926 agreement with ASCAP and the film industry, was a powerful tool for arrangers and composers, and their inclusion in films and accompaniment meant financial gains for songwriters, publishers, and film producers. At Warner Brothers, as opposed to Disney, cost was not an issue and profit could be made because Warner Brothers owned many large publishing houses. In fact, the original contract that was given to producer Leon Schlesinger particularly stated that each cartoon would feature at least one song owned by the company. Interesting financial move there. They can basically pr promote their own music and the sale of sheet music at that time and recordings um, through, the, through their own films. Writing and pacing of the cartoons would have to accommodate the songs which would interrupt the narrative to the displeasure of the directors and subsequently, the songs became the major attraction in those early cartoons, of course. Creatively, Stalling learned that he could help shape the story and elicit emotions from an audience from the use of popular music, a luxury not afforded at Disney. He would write original music for the action and use popular music and classical quotes. 
The music would all, of course, be used to accentuate a gag, so each piece would have to be very carefully selected. Certain classical composers are featured more than others, Wagner and Rossini in particular, not only because of popularity, but because their work had characteristics that best suited the cartoons. However, the composer that Stalin quoted the most was jazz band leader, composer, pianist, and inventor Raymond Scott, whose work Stalling made use of in 120 cartoons and whose music is easily some of the most recognizable in the entire genre of animated film scoring. The use of Raymond Scott's work was made possible when he sold his music publishing to Warner Brothers in 1942. Raymond Scott, of course, wrote the song Powerhouse. Sorry for my bad singing. Eventually, certain songs would always be expected to go with certain gags. An example of this is in the 1944 release Little Red Riding Hood, where Bugs Bunny dresses as Little Red Riding Hood to the accompaniment of The Lady in Red. If it works once, use it again. From then on, most times when a character dressed in red, this would be heard. Warner Brothers' early cartoons tended to be light on plot and were primarily gag-driven. Stalling scored the t uh, cartoons appropriately by using brief, rapidly changing musical cues. The short cues are consistent with the storytelling styles prevalent at Warner Brothers, which moved along from gag to gag. Again, from Daniel Goldmark's amazing book. I'm going to place an example now of what I was just describing. In this example, the violins play pizzicato at mezzo piano first at tempo, and then with shifting tempos, using retardandos and accelerandos. The rallentando at bar 53 is a gentle, relaxed release of time and has a peaceful feeling. This is then immediately changed to arco and played at tempo and at mezzo forte. The effect is quite jarring, but plays beautiful with the action, beautifully with the action on the screen. At bar 42 is a shot of a sign on a country road that says, if you're looking for fun, Shot pans up until at bar 47 we see another similar sign that says, you don't need a reason. The shot pans up again until just before we reach bar 51 we see another sign saying, all you need is a gun. One more upward pan at bar 54 and we see, it's rabbit season. One final pan up and we see at bar 56 a shot of a forest literally polluted with rabbit season signs. The tranquil effect of the country road signs and gentle music broken with the image of a crowded, dense forest filled with banners and a frantic, faster, louder music, which reaches its forte apex at bar 60. In 21 bars, we have multiple tempo changes, one time signature change, a shift from pizzicato to arco, and a gradual dynamic shift from mezzo piano to mezzo forte all in support of the action on the screen. Every director that Stalling worked for had their own style and even had their own characters that they developed. Stalling had to adapt his scoring styles to, a, to each director. This different, these differences cut. These differences in humor and style made it necessary for Stalling to vary his approach to scoring cartoons for each. His ability to adapt their particular idiosyncrasies demonstrates both his skill and his creativity as a composer. Again, from Daniel Goldbar Goldmark's book. Lastly, there is some dispute on this. Many believe it was Carl Stalling who originated the idea of the click track. If you don't know what a click track is, the click track is something that, uh, or a click is something that musicians use uh, in their headphones when recording music to keep them on tempo. Uh, people argue against this, though, that it was film composer Max Steiner. However, Stalling did lay claim to the idea, if not the practical invention. It was at Disney that the two systems were used for timing the music. The first was a system that used lines drawn on the cartoons that would give the tempo. The second, highly influential development was the use of, as I was describing, the click track. Says Stalling, the thought struck me that if each member of the orchestra had a steady beat in his ear from a telephone receiver, this would solve the problem. I had exposure sheets for the films with the, particular, with the picture broken down frame by frame, sort of like a script, and 12 of the film frames went through the projector in a half second. This gave us our beat. Thanks for tuning in. Tuning, cartooning, bad pun. 
Uh, hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to do uh, a few more of uh, my papers on Carl Stallings music coming up. Uh, for sure, check out, if you're really interested in this, the recordings called The Carl Stalling Project. You can actually hear this music and some of the crosstalk and the backtalk in the studios and get a really strong idea of how the music was actually done in the studio. They're really, really interesting recordings. Um, hit subscribe on my channel, subscribe to the channel, hit like and do all of that stuff and uh, stay tuned for more, folks. That's all, folks. Uh, thanks a lot. Bye.